In March of 2020, with less than 48 hours to prepare, we were all thrown into digital learning. For most of us, this was uncharted territory, but we're teachers. We adapt, we grow, and we learn. Now, we can take everything we've learned and apply it to create better, more effective teaching environments. One element of successfully shifting from blended or distance learning is improving the technical aspects of capturing your lessons. Make sure you view the first video in our teacher series. It was designed by professional filmmakers and features simple, effective techniques which will help you bring a level of quality and polish to your online presence. Upping the quality of your presentations, even in a small way, will help connection and engagement in ways that range from subtle to very significant. This video, number two in the series, will provide techniques that will help you engage students from afar. It will feature strategies you can start to use immediately, no matter what the school year looks like. One of the most challenging aspects of distance learning or blended learning, whatever you want to call it, is trying to adapt lessons and teaching techniques into digital formats. The magic of a great teacher is being able to make connections. Getting a class of students to truly engage with you is very challenging when teachers and learners can't share the same space. That being said, there are things a teacher can do to bridge the digital divide and bring the dynamics of a great classroom to every learner, no matter where they are. That's what we're gonna cover in this video. One of the most important pivots we need to make as educators when we enter into distance learning is understanding that the digital space is now your classroom. We have to treat digital teaching with the same intentionality that we use in our classrooms. When we start thinking about digital presentation with the same careful application of skills as we do live in-person teaching, that's when we can truly move forward and help kids learn. For most educators, the shift to distance learning was an ordeal to be weathered, to survive, just something to get through. As a result, many of us were way more lax than we would have been in our actual classrooms. In some cases, we weren't even sure what the rules were for a class video call, and it quickly became apparent that we needed guidelines to ensure learning and engagement. What's more, many teachers and students will now need to unlearn some bad habits they may have developed when we were just figuring out this mode of teaching and learning. Norms and expectations for student behavior in distance learning must be clearly communicated to your students. This is no different than what teachers do every year during the first two weeks of school. This could take the form of a classroom meeting where teachers and their students create the classroom rules together. Or perhaps your school, your PLT, your grade level team, maybe even your district, has crafted a set of expectations to help you guide this process. We have an entire series of videos for secondary and elementary age students to help shape effective distance learning norms that can assist you with this process. Research has shown that when a group creates and establishes the rules and procedures together, there's an increased buy-in and adherence to those rules and procedures. Ownership empowers kids to be their very best. So, include them in this process. Rules and norms should be written down and posted so they can be easily referenced by everyone. Perhaps pinning these rules on a class website or posting them in the chat at the start of every class will help your students digest and then meet your expectations. We suggest following the norms as outlined in our student video segments. Cameras on. Microphone off and less prompted appropriate use of chat functions. Sit up and be in a space that is set for learning. Avoid distractions like eating, pets, multiple devices, or having multiple tabs open. Be prepared and be on time. Reinforcing and upholding norms. Once you've established the way your class is going to run, hold that line. This is exactly like your physical classroom. The rules and procedures you create and communicate in the first few classes need to be upheld, and it's up to you to do so. We as teachers can all remember a time when we had a great plan and a new process and we introduced it to the kids. You know what I'm talking about. It was awesome for about three weeks until things got hectic like they always do, and the whole thing kind of just fell by the wayside and was forgotten. We cannot let that happen with distance learning it's already challenging enough. Maybe you're just now seeing this and the year has already started. It's no problem. It's never too late to stop, take stock, 
and set up new guidelines for success. Learning is about adapting, and so is teaching. These structures and procedures will help support and guide everyone, you, your students, and their families through distance learning. So rely on them, adhere to them. Kids will notice that you're maintaining the norms and they'll quickly get on board. And you can still use PBIS strategies, class rewards, incentives, just as you would in your classroom for participating in a debate or positive actions like keeping their camera on, appropriate use of the side chat, or being patient with each other concerning the mute button. One classroom guideline we feel is vital to effective learning is having the students turn their cameras on. We know sometimes, sometimes, technology issues will not allow this. However, as much as humanly possible, students should show themselves on camera. There's many reasons for this. It becomes the only way we can accurately take attendance. It helps us monitor that a student is actually in class, not logged on and napping in the other room. And being able to see our kids enables us to check up on their well-being during some very trying circumstances. When a learner is struggling with emotional or physical health, we as teachers can often pick up on this quickly when we're in person. With distance learning, it may become more subtle and therefore more difficult to discern. Having clear expectations in place about how to show up as a learner will help us as educators notice when a student is not showing up or showing up in a way that's a symptom of a larger issue. Having these expectations in place allows us to quickly and effectively offer support. Just because we aren't in the same room, that doesn't mean our students don't need us. If anything, it might mean they need us even more. There's been some important, long overdue conversation about equity and student camera use. Some learners might feel self-conscious about their appearance. We get it. And after 23 years of teaching 6th through 12th grade, I think this is exactly the same as the in-class experience. These are awkward, uncomfortable years for many of our learners, but they still need to be present and accounted for as part of their education. And when everyone is required to be present, the uncomfortability quickly fades away. Also, some students are not comfortable showing their living spaces. We understand. In our student videos, we've included tips and techniques for students to manage their spaces and create more comfortable backgrounds. Because if we truly want all kids to learn, it's imperative we create structures that help get them to class, fully engage while there, and ensure they have the support they need, especially now. The first thing teachers can do to keep students alert and connected during distance learning is to break up their lesson or class meetings into seven to 12 minute chunks. These small concentrated segments of instruction are key to keeping kids engaged. There's a wealth of research showing that students' attention spans are two to five minutes times the age of the learner. This research says that a six-year-old can focus on a task for 12 to 30 minutes and a 16-year-old can focus on a task for 32 to 80 minutes. We feel shortening this even more is better for online education and recommend that learning segments last between 7 and 12 minutes. Shortening lessons to this length will help mirror the way students are used to consuming digital content. In the classroom, teachers can easily reduce distractions and use redirection and refocusing techniques that simply aren't available with distance learning. Does this mean that all lessons have to last between seven to 12 minutes? <laughs> no, it means that every seven to 12 minutes, get some feedback from the students about their understanding and create a break that allows the learner to process and maybe move in a creative way. Have the kids take a stretch break. Everyone stand up and turn in a circle. Try to do the wave across the tiled view of your screen. Take a group bathroom break. Everybody stop, go open and close your front door and come right back. These shifts are especially necessary for our kinesthetic learners. Then you return to the learning. This will help you take into account the natural tendencies of your students and keep them engaged. Let's pause here. Open up a document on your device or get out a piece of paper and write yourself a note. What are some ways you plan to create physical movement for your students?
One of the most powerful tools teachers have for making connections with our students is our eyes. There are few forces more powerful than a good teacher stare or more encouraging than the nodding approval of an instructor. But in distance learning, we teachers are often distracted by the tech and we forget to use our greatest assets, our face. In order to better utilize this tool, we have to retrain ourselves. We need different techniques than we use when we're with students in person. In an in-person class, we are always monitoring our students, looking at them, sending them signals with our facial expressions, and receiving feedback from them via nonverbal cues. When we attempt this same type of monitoring on an electronic screen, we tend to look away from our students because we're no longer looking at them through the camera. This causes them to disengage, and before we know it, the students aren't sending any feedback and the cycle continues and deepens. This self-perpetuating disengagement can be nearly impossible to recover from. So, in order to train yourself to make eye contact with your students across a digital divide, you need to practice. There are webcams built into devices that are oriented so when you look at the screen, it appears as if you're looking at your students. If this is the case, you don't have to change much. However, most devices, especially phones and tablets and add-on cameras, they don't have this function. In this case, teachers should train themselves to look directly at the camera on their device. Yes, this means looking away from your students, which is especially challenging because we've been trained our entire careers to key in on the kids. And even though it is fully and totally counterintuitive, by looking away from their actual faces and staring into the camera, your students will see you looking directly at them. They will engage and they will connect. Some teachers and presenters find it helpful to put a sticker or a post-it note near the camera so they know exactly where to look. My favorite method is from a teacher who put two sticky googly eyes on each side of her computer's lens so she makes eye contact every time. This eye contact is key and a skill that can be quickly learned and make a huge difference in your teaching. Now, let's pause the video. Identify the camera lens on your device and if it helps you, use a sticker or post-it note or anything else that will help you focus on it in the future. The best way to do this is to jump on a call with a few peers or friends and practice. Have them tell you when it feels like you're looking at them and proceed from there. Here's a question that arises at this point. If we're looking at our camera lens and not at our students' faces, how do we get student feedback? How will we monitor kids' learning if we're staring at a camera? The answer is, you need to ask for it. In our series of videos for students, we introduce three distinct hand gestures to be used in class to help teachers receive and interpret feedback. Gesture one. The first is a new one developed especially for the potential chaos of the online class call. Instead of everyone yelling, you're on mute, the split second anyone starts to talk and can't be heard, we're teaching students to cup their hand at their ear, palm forward, and wait quietly. This creates space for you as the teacher to gently ask the student to check their mic settings and it minimizes the chorus of shouts and directions that regularly occur in classrooms and business calls alike. Now this will need to be taught and reinforced just as with any classroom norm or procedure. Pro tip, have a quick and easy set of directions to unmute the mic safe and easily accessible so you can post them fast in the class chat for kids who need that tech support. Gesture number two. The second gesture is the appropriate way to raise a hand on a digital call. We know students have dozens of different ways of raising their hands, all of which are as unique as they are. And in a physical classroom, most of them work well. That is not the case in distance learning. Kids should raise their hand, palm forward at about eye level, and wave it gently. This will not only allow it to be easier for you to see your kids and their hands, it will also create and reinforce their engagement in the digital space. Gesture number three. The third motion we are modeling in student videos is thumbs up. Teachers need to be more deliberate in seeking specific feedback and need to do so more frequently on digital platforms in order to maintain engagement. So, build in specific moments when you ask your kids if they're comfortable moving on. Students who are comfortable moving on should show a thumbs up at eye level. 
If the student does not show thumbs up, that's a clear sign they need more support. Educational researchers from Marzano to Danielson and Hattie all stress the importance of frequent, meaningful feedback. So be sure to check in early and often with your students and pay close attention to the signals they are sending. Teachers should intentionally build these moments for movement into your 7 to 12 minute segments. Some platforms have chat features, literally options to virtually raise hands or virtually give a thumbs up. Some do not. You as a teacher know your students and you know what works for you as well as which specific features your kids will have access to. Use what works for you and your students just as you've done throughout your entire career. These three hand gestures and how to use them are outlined and taught in our student videos. So most likely your kids have already seen them and are getting up to speed. These gestures combined with features from your platform as well as your personal preferences as a teacher are the tools you can rely on throughout the year. Now's a great time to pause the video and explore the functions of your learning platforms. Decide on the best and most effective ways to use them. Maybe get some of your colleagues or your PLT to do a practice call together. Play with the functions and features. See what works for you. Some of the techniques that came into vogue over the last 10 years that concern progress monitoring are perfectly suited for the digital classroom. Using techniques like fist to five, nod if you understand, raise your hand if you can do the next equation on your own, these become the methods of feedback and progress monitoring we sorely need when we are not in the same room with our learners. The hand gestures outlined earlier are a few of the tools you can use. This is a great point. Many of the techniques you use in classroom teaching can easily be adapted to your digital learning. Think back to your favorites and what worked for you and see if with a slight adjustment, they can be used now. In some cases, teachers feel the need to immediately sign off and leave their students to practice and work with the concepts on their own. We suggest staying on the call, muting yourself, and asking the kids to work and practice while you continue to monitor them. Your keen teacher's eye will quickly see who needs more support, just as you would if you were walking around your physical classroom. This, once again, calls for us as teachers to rethink distance learning. Don't think of an online class as if it's a painful but needed procedure to be endured. Rather, think about it as what it is. It's time with your students where you can guide them as learners. So, slow down, take your time, be patient with yourself and your students as they learn and process. As you can see, many of these elements really start to build upon each other to create dynamic, engaging, and effective learning environments in the digital space for students and teachers. When communicating information to students and their parents or guardians in these times, it's especially important to be multimodal. What do we mean by this? It may be a new term, but it is something that teachers do all the time and have always done. Multimodal means presenting the same information in a variety of ways. In a traditional classroom setting, this can mean the assignment is written on the board, talked about in class, a paper copy is handed out, and it's posted on the class website. In a digital classroom, this means you may send out information in an email that's all text, send a short video of you explaining that very same information, and then send a notification from your class website as a reminder. This serves two purposes. First, it makes sure there are multiple ways for stakeholders to interact with important information. That means whichever mode they feel most comfortable with is available to them and they'll be able to absorb it. Secondly, it makes sure things don't get missed. In distance learning, inboxes fill up fast. There are always updates and it's incredibly easy for information to get lost or go unseen. Multimodal communication makes sure all lessons get delivered, heard, and understood. We know not all students will have the same access to devices and the internet. We as teachers must do our very best to create equal opportunity to access learning for all kids. 
One simple step is to record all lessons, class meetings, and class calls and post these in a place that kids can easily find them. Many students will not have access to synchronous learning simply because their home schedule doesn't line up for it. These students must still be able to see and hear their classmates and teachers, even if it's at a later date or time. Keeping an archive of the classes also supports learners who need to go back and review, especially if they've had a tech issue or have an IEP or 504 plan, because the recordings become tools of support only when they're accessible. Multimodal often means managing numerous different platforms, websites, apps, and passwords, which is difficult for learners and teachers alike. One way you as a teacher can support your learners is creating a one-stop shop for all the links, passwords, and any support info. If you keep pertinent information like logins, web addresses, and such in a consistent, easy to access place, it will aid the kids and their supporters at home, helping them navigate the content and will reduce barriers to access. Some districts use a learning management system that does all this, or perhaps you could pin a post at the top of your class website or always include it at the top of your weekly newsletter home. Be sure to include any IT support services your district might offer, including the hours that support is available. Remember, distance learning doesn't always follow a bell schedule, and many learners will be doing school when it works for them in their home schedule, not always during traditional school hours. The difference between social distancing and physical distancing. While we are engaged in digital learning, it is important to realize the differences between social distancing and physical distancing. Students need socialization as much as they need to meet standards, maybe even more. As long as school is happening online, the socialization part of school should be happening online as well. Perhaps because they are so uncomfortable with the online format, a great many teachers simply rush through their lessons. They get in and they get out. This ignores their students' need for connection with their teacher and with each other. To address this, teachers need to balance their content with true engagement. Many of us are as concerned about social emotional health as we are about content standards. Worrying doesn't meet those needs, so we as teachers must intentionally plan elements of our lessons to both connect with and support our learners as people. To help, here are some suggestions for activities that will boost your engagement with the kids and their connections with their classmates. Have a scavenger hunt. Make it lesson themed if appropriate. Show and tell. At higher grade levels, this could also include presenting poetry or showing artwork. A question of the day. Maybe there's even a prize. Themed day. Again, here's a great chance to tie something into the lesson that's specific that they can do. Morning meeting. Something as simple as letting kids say hi will foster all sorts of connection. There are as many ideas for creating connections as there are teachers. When it comes down to it, you know your students, so have fun and be creative. It's crucially important to keep in mind the key elements of building and maintaining relationships with your students, as well as their relationship with their peers, their schools, and their classes. If they are on the screen, find ways to connect with them. Physical distance is not social distance. Schools have always been as much about connection as they have been about content. We must keep that in mind as we move forward. Now that you've watched both teacher videos, Use this new mindset, this new technical knowledge, and these tips and tools to make better connections with your students. We would say good luck, but we teachers know luck has nothing to do with it. Education is hard work, intentionality, and heart. Use the lessons from these videos to carry on the vital work of educating our kids.